busily move your mind to better understand the world that's around you and to make sense of how it works and where it's going. Your mind is always curious and inquisitive, and it is always thinking, it is always ruminating, and it is always contempl contemplating. So in that very sense, you m may be an active person in the life of your mind, even though you may not be so active in the physical and the social domains. You are an active person in the world of your mind. And I start this way today because as we come to the second sermon on the Holy Spirit this morning, I just wanted to open up by asking you this deeper question. Is the Holy Spirit an active person among the triune Godhead? Is the Holy Spirit an active person among the triune Godhead? We hear very often about the Father and the Son in the work of salvation, and we know that both the Father and the Son, who share the same divine nature, are very busy and active toward the creation and, of course, toward uh, His precious church, the Son. Jesus Christ is our only mediator who has the power to forgive our sins and to invite us into God's heavenly kingdom. And we should rightly honor his unique contribution to the divine work of salvation for us. Sooner we, sh we should never neglect the work of the Son and the being of the Son in our Christian life. And of course, the Father is the name. We should always glorify and uplift whatever we do as Christians. And so we should rightly move through the Son to the Father, so to speak, so that our life here in this world can be rightly anchored in the love that the Father shares with the Son. We rightly need to focus on the Father and the Son for our Christian life in this world. But even still, even still, do we have to think of the Spirit in terms of being a shy or a quiet person? Or should we view him as active as the Father and the Son in the work of creation and also in the work of salvation? Is the Spirit an active agent in relation to God's work for his people? And how should we view him as we endeavor to understand more about the Spirit in light of the Bible? And how should we view the Spirit in relation to our Christian Life Is he inactive or shy? Or is he active and outgoing, so to speak? And so today we'll examine three important aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit uh, that the Bible tells us about. We can cover a lot more, of course. We can spend months and months to cover the wide range of uh, the ministries that the, uh, the Spirit does in the world and for God's people, but we're going to focus on three things today. And we'll see, I hope and pray, that the Spirit is actually not shy or quiet, is not withdrawn or introverted, as we like to say, but the Spirit is very active and proactive, so much so that we should always think of Him as an active agent in the work of creation and also in the work of salvation. The Spirit moves a lot. The Spirit moves a lot and He is never static. And He is as busy, busy as the Father and the Son in changing our lives and bringing us to the kingdom of our God. And He is so outgoing that He is known in the Bible as the one who brings Christ down to us from heaven, and he enjoys socializing with God's people here in this world. And so that's going to be the emphasis for today's sermon, the work of the Holy Spirit. And the first area that we'll look at today is the Holy Spirit's work in relation to the creation of the earth. The Holy Spirit's work in the creation of the earth. We are covering some mega scale works of the Spirit today, and we'll get to more personal and, let's say, uh, a saving work of the Spirit in relation to human persons. And for this topic, uh, at least for today, I want to start from Genesis chapter 1, 
verses 1 and 2. I'm sure that you're familiar with the verses already, a very important and well-known verses in the Bible. And today, let's spend some time thinking about this verse in relation to the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, I will read it for you, but if you open up your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, you will find and read these important verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so clearly here we see that God created the universe, the entire universe, but the earth was formless and empty when it was first created. It was not inhabited by any living creatures uh, in its original condition, at least according to here uh, in the opening verses. And although the Hebrew word God here is plural in form, that is Elohim, the verb create here is actually singular. God created the heavens and the earth. God there is plural in form, but the verb created is singular in form. And I think this grammatical structure suggests that the work of creation is described from the very beginning as a common and singular work of the triune Godhead. Creation is the work of the triune God. And right after verse 1, we see the name, the Spirit of God, being mentioned in verse 2. And we see that his initial work towards the creation or in the creation was quite simply hovering over the waters. That is, hovering over the face of the waters. There were emptiness and darkness all around the earth, not in the sense of wickedness, but in the sense of nothingness with respect to creaturely contents and order. And in that very context, we see the Spirit of God hovering over and making His presence known to creation and to the entire universe. The name of the Spirit is mentioned in the very beginning of the Bible. And what that means is that the first instance of God coming down to creation was done through and by the Holy Spirit. The first agent of the Trojan God who practiced the Emmanuel principle, that is God with us, wasn't actually the second person of the Trinity uh, in the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, although there is a very important event in the history of this world, like incarnation is the Emmanuel par excellence. But still... The Spirit came to creation in the very, very beginning and executed the principle of Emmanuel long before the coming of the Word. It was the Spirit who was with the world and in the world displaying that God is with us. And then we can go, go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Our elder read that passage for us before. And if we go to Deuteronomy 32 in the Old Testament, we'll come back to Genesis 1 later soon. But if we go to Deuteronomy, we find very similar descriptions of God's work for Israel that resembles the expressions that we have here in Genesis chapter 1. So I'd like to read a few verses from Deuteronomy 32, uh, verses 8 to 12. And there we read these words. And let's think about Genesis 1 as we read this or hear this passage. Verse 8, When the Most High, or God, divided their inheritance to the nations, when God separated the sons of Adam, He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is the place of His inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in, in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. And he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up and carrying them on its wings. 
So the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign god with him. Now here the uh, the word wasteland in verse 10 is a variation of the word used in Genesis 1 verse 2 that is without form or formless. And the word hovering used here in verse 11, Deuteronomy 32, is a variation of the word used in Genesis 1 verse 2 that is hovering over the face of the waters. And so I think what we can gather from these expressions is that when the Spirit Spirit of God moved over or around the original creation, He did that not as a tyrant or dictator that just enjoyed the empty and dark place, but He came down as a gentle and caring agent that brought with Him protection, order, And life, right from the very beginning of the creation, we see the Spirit of God bringing down the sacred onto the secular, so to speak. And His movement in the very beginning was so important that it had to be written down in the Scriptures for all of God's people to remember. It was so important that we have to, uh, it was so important that it's written here in the opening passages of the Bible, and it's written there for us to remember, acknowledge the Spirit of God who came down to be with us. And before we encounter other names like the Father and the Son more prominently in the New Testament, and before we encounter other names like Yahweh or Jehovah, in other parts of the Old Testament. The first reference to the being of the triune God here is actually the Spirit, who, like we saw last week, is the Spirit of the Father and of the Son. The Bible begins by telling us about the Spirit of God before it talks about the coming of the Son or even the glory of the Father. And it does that partly because throughout the Bible... The Spirit is consistently invoked as the giver of life. The Spirit is consistently invoked as the giver of life in the Bible. For example, Psalm 104, verse verse 30. You send forth your Spirit, and they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. And so as we reflect on his presence in the early chapters of the Bible, uh, I think we are reminded of his role as a gentle and caring agent who brings with him protection, order, and life. Uh, Just like an extroverted person can be really good at making people laugh and enjoy the uh, social environment, well, the Holy Spirit is really great at giving life in order to anything that's around him. And just like the presence of a humorous person can brighten up the atmosphere quickly, the Holy Spirit produces vitality and activity whenever he makes his presence known to those who are in the dark and experiencing emptiness. And so just as the Spirit willingly came down onto the empty creation, He also desires to bring hope and peace to those who are experiencing darkness in their lives, who are experiencing emptiness. And the Spirit is still continuing that caring ministry even in the 21st century as an active agent in the work of grace. And so if you are having a challenging time right now, it may be due to health, It may be due to relationship. It may be due to financial situations. Uh, Then I can confidently encourage you this morning that the Spirit can come to you and bring back the vitality that you desperately need to keep going in your life. The Spirit can come to you any day and provide the strength that you need in Jesus Christ to overcome your darkness, and it can come in you and for you any time to reorder your spiritual activities for a deeper life in Jesus Christ and for a deep, deeper life in God's covenant of grace. 
of the work of creation here and the spirit hovering over the creation is a mega scale reflection of what the spirit can do for God's people. It's not totally detached from his ministry for God's people. This is a mega scale reflection of what the spirit can do for God's people. And so as we read this today, we should be reminded that the spirit does desire to come into our hearts that are empty and void, and he can change them for the glory of the Father and of the Son, and of course, for your joy in him. So seek the Spirit, ask the Spirit to come into your life through prayer, through reading, through hearing and fellowship, and of course, through public worship. Open your hearts to his gentle presence and cling to God's promise by faith. Fill your mind with God's word and meditate on his truth day in and day out. And please find comfort in the truth that the spirit comes to believers is a caring and gentle agent who brings with him the peace and power from heaven in order to take you to the world of heaven where God dwells with the Son forever. And so let that be the first point for us today, that the Spirit was an active agent in the work of creation. And please remember that as you spend the rest of the day. And on a related note, the second area that we need to appreciate about the Spirit is His involvement in the creation of heaven. We first briefly considered the Spirit's involvement in the creation of the earth, but the Bible also tells us that the Spirit was involved uh, in the heavenly domain, the creation and sustenance of heaven. As one who sanctifies the space as, and as one who unites the visible and the invisible by his sanctifying power. And now we can come back to the Genesis passage in chapter 1 and zoom in on the word heavens there in verse 1. And in saying this, I should acknowledge that uh, there are different ways to understand the meaning of the word heavens here in the verse. Because some people say that it refers to the visible sky or the galaxy world that is above the earth, like where the sun is, where the moon is, where the stars are. But there are some others who say that, well, this includes the invisible upper world that we regard as heaven. Uh, this does not exclude that heavenly invisible world, uh, and it includes uh, that domain, so to speak, uh, as we read about the initial work of creation. And I think it's quite persuasive to understand the word here in Genesis as inclusive of the invisible domain that the Bible regards as heaven. Because for one thing, I think Paul in Colossians chapter 1 picks up the creation language and relates, I think, heaven to the invisible realm in distinction from the visible realm. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities, or powers. Again, by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And although Genesis 1 doesn't explicitly say that the Spirit created the invisible heaven like it does about the sun here in Colossians chapter 1, we still have so many reasons to think, well, the Spirit was definitely involved in the creation of the world, and He knows that world most perfectly. Because if the Spirit did not know anything about heaven or that heavenly city, then how could He create the replicas of heaven here in this world? The Old Testament tabernacles and temples were created as copies or uh, shadows or replicas of heaven by the work of the Holy Spirit. You can read Hebrews chapter 8 to find those exact expressions. Those were exact copies or 
not exact, but copies and shadows of that heavenly city. And I think we have to conclude that the Spirit knew that heavenly world perfectly right from the very beginning. And because He knew that world perfectly well, He was able to reveal that world to His people and inspire the biblical authors to, or leaders to make tabernacles and temples according to that original heaven. And if the Spirit was not the creator of the heavenly world, and if He did not have any access to that domain as freely as the Father and the Son, then how could He know perfectly about this space and invite, for example, the Apostle John to see how that world looks like? Uh, we find in Revelation uh, that the Apostle John was in the Spirit, and then he saw the heaven unfold before his very eyes. And as we, as we know very well from that famous chapter, chapter 21, John clearly said that one of the angels carried him away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed him the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And so the Spirit was the one who knew where heaven was and how to get there. And because he knew that, he was able to lead the Apostle John to the world and carry him right to the entrance of the space by means of a vision. He knew the details of the heavenly world. And because he knew that, he saw that space. But, uh, he revealed that space to his beloved Apostle uh, John. And so, uh, I won't make this point too long, but one thing I have to say is that if you want to know more about heaven, if you desire to belong to that heavenly kingdom of God more quickly, let's say, more willingly and joyfully, then you need the Holy Spirit. If you want to belong to the kingdom of God and enter into that heavenly domain, well, you need the Holy Spirit. You need him to see the world and see it as a reality, not as a fictional, fictional imagery that we just like to, you know, use for our imagination, for our, you know, temporary hope. Well, no. We need the Spirit to see that world written for us in the Scripture as a reality awaiting, awaiting for us and, and uh, the, the reality that we will soon experience at the coming of Jesus Christ or our enters into the place according to God's own timing. So let this be a simple encouragement for you, which is pray to the Spirit so that He may show you the wonders of heaven more clearly and vividly. Uh, we need to be captivated, captivated by the reality of heaven according to the scriptures. And God desires us to look forward to that world, look forward to that time when the Spirit would come down and unite the visible and the invisible. And we need to wait for the time when the Spirit would make everything perfect for our communion with the Father, with the Son, and of course with the Spirit Himself. We need the Spirit to bring heaven down to earth and to take us up to heaven where Jesus Christ is living right now. So let me encourage you to pray to Him and ask the Spirit to create in you a longing for that heavenly city because the, sp uh, the Spirit knows the heavenly world most perfectly and He can show you its glory, its mystery, and its reality. And then we can move on to the third and the last area for us today. And let me invite you to meditate on the Holy Spirit's work in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. In the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And we can come back to the passage that we read before, the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. And uh, we can read all the way from verse 26 to 38, but for the sake of time, I won't read the whole passage. But let me instead uh, refer you to verse 35 in particular. Verse 
35 here in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. And as you look at this verse 35, you might ask yourself, well, why is the Holy Spirit there? Why, why does the Holy Spirit get the attention in the conception of Jesus Christ? Like, why shouldn't the Father get the credit for sending the Son? And why shouldn't the Son get all the attention when it was Him who agreed in eternity to take on the human flesh to save and redeem God's people? Why not the other persons in the Trinity, but the Spirit that is mentioned here in the story of Christ's birth? And again, I think that's, the, that's because the kind of work described in the conception of Jesus highlights the typical work of the Holy Spirit that he showed throughout history. We saw from Genesis 1 that it was the Spirit hovering over the empty creation. We also considered that it was the Spirit who brought the sacred down to the secular, so to speak, or the divine to the human. And so by being consistent with his, with his assigned work or his agreed work, the spirit, spirit went into an empty womb of the Virgin Mary and created life in order when there was nothing there that was able to generate a new life by its own power. It was so empty and void that the womb of the Virgin Mary was something like a creation without any contents in order. But the Spirit moved around it and entered into it. And as he did that, he brought forth the new life there as the giver of life. And not just the giver of any life in this context, but the giver of our life, of our mediator. The Spirit was the one who enabled the conception of Christ, not because the Father and the Son lack the power, they do have the power, but because the Spirit had always been working specifically as the giver of life, both natural and supernatural. And uh, this incarnation witnesses to that stable pattern of the Spirit's work, where the divine and the human is met, and where the grace is joined to the nature. And we are, able to, we are also able to see here that the Spirit did not only work in Mary's womb, but He also worked in her heart. In her heart. Because right here in verse 38, she confessed by the work of the Holy Spirit, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She put her faith in the promise, let it be to me according to your word to your word. And so as a way to conclude our sermon, uh, let me just highlight that we should always seek the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit because when He comes down to us, He will bring God's presence and power. And when He hovers and dwells in our midst, He will produce life and love that naturally increase our spiritual vitality. We should always remember to please the Spirit by our faith, by our hope, and by our love in Jesus Christ. And we should always invoke His name and rely on Him to make us love Jesus Christ all the more because Jesus came to die for us and to raise us up from the dead and to make us enter into the kingdom of God and enjoy the eternal communion with the Father with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. So is the Holy Spirit an active person among the Godhead? Of course He is. The Holy Spirit is very active in creating, was active in the creating the world, and is still very active in making us the citizens of that heavenly kingdom and as uh, recipients of God's saving grace. So do you need more vitality and strength in your spiritual life? Uh, you were very fervent and passionate in your early years in your Christian life, and you seem to have lost that power, enthusiasm? Well, it is an uh, now is the opportune time to rely on the Spirit and to reignite that passion that you had for the Lord Jesus 
and to give you the vitality that you need for your life in our triune God. So rely on the Spirit, pray to Him, and may He bless you this week as you go to Him and cling to His power and promise for your life, for your strength, and for your hope. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you that you have gathered us in this place to meditate on the words that speak to the special work of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us remember that uh, it was, although it was the whole triune God that created the entire universe, help us remember uh, to praise the Spirit for hovering over the waters and uh, making your presence known in this creation. Help us not neglect the Spirit. Um, help us not grieve the Spirit by our negligence or stubbornness, but help us pay attention to His work, His being, so that we can always rely on Him for our life in Jesus Christ. And Father, please we pray that you would create, create in us a deeper longing for our fellowship with Jesus, especially in the kingdom of God, not just here in this world, but in the new creation, in the new heavens. And help us look forward to that time uh, where, uh, when we can enjoy this communion that we have with you eternally without any stoppage, without any interruption, and help us love you all the more because you sent us the Spirit despite the absence of our Lord Jesus in his body. So we thank you for the Holy Spirit, and we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.